Mail has got a long title, The Impact of China's Economic Turmoil and Challenges in Today's Technology Metal Supply Chain. And I'm sure you're guessing with this long title that the person who must have written this would have been Mr. Lipton. So let's start with Jack Lipton. Jack, can you tell us what the premise is of this panel? I'm sure I agree with What was the question? <laughs> Introducing myself, I'm the founder and the publisher for Investor Intel. And Jack Lipton is our most popular writer on Investor Intel. His numbers go through the roof no matter what he writes about. And uh, Jack is like all of my writers, uh, they don't always listen to me. Jack, what is this panel about based on the title? The supply chain. Is, is this the panel where we're talking about the Chinese economics of the situation? Yes. Okay, good. So that's what it's about. Uh, it's, it's how does the Chinese economic situation impact these global markets for technology companies? That's correct. And you have some very strong opinions on this, so I would like you to start with that. Uh, I, I, my politics are, are a little to the right of Rand Paul in the U.S. I think he's too liberal. And all of my life, I've been a very conservative guy. Uh, although I voted for Hubert Humphrey for President Trump. In, in any case, I've, I've now changed my mind. I've come to, to a conclusion. The China, forget about the turmoil in China. They're doing it right. China is treating its production of natural resources the way the United States and Canada and Britain did in 1943. You have to have these things so they're not worried about costs or about investments or about people uh, monetizing uh, you know, dirt and, and, and making it into a tradable uh, asset. None of that matters to them. Their government guarantees that they will produce them. You'll never see a, a, a natural resource stop production in China because there's market turmoil. You'll, yes, of course, when, if the price is zero, nobody's going to produce anything. That's, that's correct. They are doing that right for a, a world that's going to be, that is more and more based on technology. They're doing that right. Now, I, I'm not a fan of their, of their uh, political system, and I'm not a fan of their economic system, which I call fascism, or uh, some people call it you know, state-directed uh, corporations. But it's working for them. It's working for them. And it's the reason we're having a problem. We have no floor here. You, we can stop producing things simply because prices go down with no thought for the future. What are you, now, what are you going to do if there's a consumer boom in Indiana and you haven't got enough technology mills to make the, the phones and, and the cars and things they want? Well, you'll run the prices up and have another boom in prices. This is all real nonsense, folks. And okay, maybe I'm the only one. The only risk there is in any of this is the risk of not having the material you need. Whatever you think about the Chinese, they figured this out on day one. They've solved it. Right? They're always going to have these materials. We have the problem because we we financialized everything and we've forgotten about the fact that the purpose of producing these materials is to use them, not to make money on them. Okay, so that's me. I'm an old guy, you know, my bucket list got one thing, I want a magnet convertible, that's it. The rest of you want all these, you know, Trump Tower and all that stuff, that's great. I think that the Chinese turmoil doesn't matter to the production of, they will be producing the words they need. And somebody in the hallway asked me, are the words oversupply? Yes. Demand is down. There's too much material. So what do you think is going to happen to price? Okay, it's going to go down. This this system will that's the way this is the world works. It'll it'll come back again. Can we all wait long enough for it? I don't know. But I can tell you this. The Chinese will never stop producing this material so long as they have a need for it that is not a financial need, an actual need to make products. Think about that next time you pick up the Wall Street Journal and read about how somebody made a killing on derivatives of derivatives of derivatives. Terrific. Thank you. That's my time. Okay, I'm torn between who's going to provide the rebuttal to Jack. 
I think I'm going to throw this at Paul LaRue from Linus, because uh, you spend a lot of time in China. You're competing with the Chinese, and of course, Linus is pr uh, producing two thirds of all the rare earths um, that are not out of China. So, Paul, what do you have to say to Jack's comment? Uh, first, um, I will start saying that I have a great respect to the Chinese uh, government and president, and I had to deal in my past job in shutting down two factories in China, and I met a number of uh, government officers, they are all great business guys, so think of China government as a bunch of very smart guys. Um, now, I think that we always talk about China, whereas uh, there are they 1.2 billion people, and they are not all the same. So there is an agenda um, in the central government, and uh, when I was competing in Zalaster when we were younger, a long time ago, um, basically in 2002, uh, Rodia, the company was working for, we were producing all our products in France, in the US, and in Japan. When I left, I was producing 100% of it in China. And they were triggering the resource in forcing us to transfer productions from France, Japan, US to China. And it was very effective uh, because at the end of the day, uh, my core business was phosphorus and all the lamps, or let's say 90% of the lamps today, are made in China. And so this has worked very well. Um, I believe now the central government agenda is very different because they have succeeded in uh, leveraging the resource, they have succeeded in developing a very, very powerful downstream industry. And that's what they are focusing on, because being the king of magnet would be the trigger to becoming the, the king of hybrid cars, of efficient, energy efficient motors. That's where the battle is now. And uh, they don't have necessary to leverage the resource anymore. So that's for the central, that's for China Co-LTD. Uh, I was in China three weeks ago, and um, then you have to deal with the 1.2 billion Chinese. And they are struggling with the price situation. And Chinese love money. And I like Chinese because they love money. I think we should all love money. And they hate losing money. And they are losing money these days. And they are losing money because the recent regulation increased the gap, the cost gap between the legal producers and the illegal producers. And the legal ones got really mad at this situation because they pay more, they are uh, asked to enforce the environmental regulation, and they see a growing part of the production, close to 40% today, is from illegal mining. And that's why we saw recently a price decrease. Uh, trying the legal trying to fight against the illegal, but not later than yesterday and this morning, uh, the sixth group, future group of uh, China Co Ltd, announced it would reduce the production and um, and go for a price increase because the situation was absolutely unbearable for them. So I think there are two agendas, and we always need to discriminate between China Co and uh, individual companies that don't necessarily have the same uh, agenda. Next, I would like to introduce you to Alistair Neal. If you don't know Alistair, he's a, a wonderful surprise at this event. He's one of the top North American consultants for, uh, for uh, rare earth companies in China, technology metal companies in China. He spent a lot of years in China. Uh, he provides us with a lot of data for investor intel about what is really happening. Um, I'd love your response to Paul's response, please, about what's really happening in China, Alistair, because I know you're right on top of this. Okay. Uh, this, so, yeah, okay, that's all right. Um, thank you, Tracy. Uh, yeah, what I agree a lot with what uh, Paul has said. We've both spent a lot of time in China living there and working there and the th key is that there are different levels of government in China as there are in, in every country but the state puts out a vision but it has to be implemented at a local level and some of the local government officials are somewhat conflicted because they actually own and operate some of the illegal production 
because they can make more money running illegally than they can working for the government. So when the government says we have to shut down legal production, they have to look at their wallets because as Paul said, uh, they love money. Uh, there, I was once described to me that China is a bunch of capitalists just surrounded in a communist balloon. And if you do business with them, you'll find that out very quickly. Uh, they are shutting down production. A large number of the legal producers, I think, are finding that they can't make money at today's prices. So they are actively uh, reducing that. The question is, will the illegal production step back at the same time? You know, the main market outside of China is Japan. Japanese are very pragmatic. Um, you know, when I was with uh, Dasha or AMR, it took five years to qualify lands in, in the optical glass business in Japan. When uh, China shut the doors in 2010, uh, I qualified on a certificate of analysis overnight. So they will adjust. Uh, they will buy a legal material. Uh, it may be shipped out as calcium carbonate and arrive in Tokyo as cerium carbonate. So they will blend that material in. But to get back to the earlier point about China, um, you know, they're going through a real tough transition. People I talked to in Beijing, if they hit 4% growth this year, they're doing well. The RMB could go to seven, so they're going to continue to devalue the currency. And that will have, you know, certain ramifications, obviously. Okay, so I'm now gonna move to uh, uh, Guy Barassa from Namaska Lithium. Uh, Guy, it's my understanding, I know you know a lot about China, and uh, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether or not there's an increase in electric, electric vehicle uh, demand or not in China. There's a lot of conflict in data in the media. We know we're constantly sorting through it. But we do understand that there is a, an incredible uh, increase in demand for lithium. Can you respond to this? Well, of course. <clears throat> Maybe uh, before, uh, I would like to have some comments on the uh, earlier presentation by Jeff. Absolutely. Um, I think that the uh, Chinese strong oil uh, impact on the lithium sector itself is only uh, making a negative mood uh, on the financing capacity because analysts and investors are putting us in the same uh, pattern as all the commodities going down because of the turmoil in, in China, whereas the, uh, the, the lithium has increased in price over the years and uh, continues to increase. So, uh, like Jack said, they're not concerned about the cost of the material. They bought uh, Thaleson in Australia for a very important huge amount of money because they're dependent on outside source of lithium in China. And that uh, links to your question about the increase in their vision of the lithium uh, supply chain in China. They have a vision, very clear vision. The plan did not work as, as far um, as today, uh, getting the electric vehicles out in the numbers that they were looking for. One of the reasons, well, a couple of reasons. The, the, the one, let's see the Tesla Model S, has been built for the pleasure of driving. So it was a company, Fiesco, getting it in, uh, sold into China because the people that can afford it usually don't drive. They sit in the back and the, the car then does not meet the need of the people that can buy it. They also have extra taxes because it's a luxury car. But more important is the, their vision of electric vehicle. Electric vehicle is for somebody that has not succeeded in China. It's electric bike. You move from the scooter to the electric bike. If you want to show that you succeeded, you don't buy a Tesla. You buy a big BMW or a big Mercedes because it's a gas engine. And it's only their, their philosophy, the way uh, that it's moving slowly. But uh, uh, they will get there. They have no, absolutely no choice. And the proof is the fact that they decided to purchase, like I said, Thales and Mine in 2013 at a price that has absolutely no common sense versus our ratio of purchase for the raw material. But they don't care. I was able to attract in 2009, 2010, the largest uh, lithium processor in China by the name of Chenqi Lithium. They finally bought Talisman for $848 million. 
One comment I got from them, I said, okay, now that you bought the, the largest one, are you still going to help us? It says, he put it on the, on the shelf. We're first going to mine Australia, then we're going to mine Canada. They, they are 100 and 200 years in their vision of the development. They want to make sure that they're going to have the control on their file of the electricity, electrification of the transport in China. And they don't care about the price, they need the, the, the material, they buy it, whatever is the price. I think you brought up an excellent point. I mean, we all know that uh, the Chinese are, are focused on the development of Australia. We see a lot of Chinese investment in the rare earth space right now, and then Canada. So what, tell us about the Chinese and the Americans, please. This is, of course, Anthony Marchese from Texas Rare Earth Resources. Well, first of all, I want to comment on one of the earlier uh, statements. All of this illegal production in China would not be possible without, you know, w without the cooperation of Chinese officials. I mean, China is a military country, so you have graft at all levels. None of this exists without graft. Everybody's lining their pockets. Now, if you remember a few years ago, different, different industry, the FDA, there was an issue with tainted milk. What they do, they put the, uh, they put the head of the FDA, they killed the head of the FDA. Now there's no problems with the FDA. So China, when it wants to stamp out illegal production or illegal activities, can do so because it's a militarily run country. At some point, China will decide that it wants to you know, stamp out illegal production. And until they make an example out of a few executives, I think it will continue uh, continue to exist. So that's my take on, you know, uh, it, it's all a question of who's getting money, who's getting paid, and at what point does the country decide that they've had enough. Uh, with respect to, you know, Chinese investment in the United States, it's just not going to happen. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, in the United States, any time a foreign country makes an investment or wants to make an equity investment into a, a U.S. company, you need federal government approval. Until such time as the Chinese government allows the reverse, a U.S. company to take an equity ownership in China, we're not going to see any type of Chinese investment in the, uh, in the United States. Thank you, Anthony. That's a perfect segue. I, there's a, a journalist from Wired magazine that's been trying to get me to do a cover story on smuggling in China, out of China for the last three years, and I keep telling him, no smuggler wants PR. <laughs> and on that topic, Alistair, I have been told by a very senior source uh, in the rare earth industry that right now, 70% of all sales of rare earth exports outside of China are currently uh, provided by uh, smuggling sources. So, Alistair, we know you know a lot about this. Can you talk about this? Um, well, one thing I do know in China, any number is possible. Uh, so, you know, it could be 70%, it could be 40%. It's, it's still high. Uh, you know, I think the exports, what, total production was uh, 125,000, 150,000 tons. Uh, so you have somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 tons going out of China, um, possibly a little less. There could be as much as 25, 30,000 tons illegal production, possibly more. Um, it's, as you say, no smuggler is going to tell you how much he ships. The, the one way of trying to match it up, unfortunately, um, it's difficult because countries qualify materials differently. But if you try and match up the exports tonnage from China to Japan and the imports from Japan of rares, there is a differential. And you know that obviously comes from other places like Hong Kong or Vietnam, or rooted through different uh, ports. So it is a challenge, as I said earlier, trying to stamp it out. I don't think it'll ever be eliminated. Uh, what you have to try and do is mitigate the damage to an acceptable level, and that all comes down to as uh, Anthony is talking about, a commitment by the government at all levels. Uh, you know, it's going to take a few heads to roll. Uh, you know, a plan, they would go out and say, okay, this month we shut down 10, 15,000 tons of production. The next month, 
they would shut down 10 or 15,000 tons of production. It happened to be the same factories. Um, but they were able to report to the government. Uh, this is going back to like the Mao era when people gave numbers on grain production. And the government would take 10% to ship away. There was nothing left for the people locally because they'd overestimated their actual production. So, it, yeah, in uh, China, anything is possible, and the more difficult it is, the easier it is to happen. Then we're going to go right to Paul. Paul, obviously, this benefits you in sales because you're competing against smuggling sources. Does this help you, or are the smugglers' prices just, you know, kicking your hind end? I mean, based on your sales, it looks like you're winning. I just want to emphasize one thing. Um, we talk about Chinese, but if Chinese smuggle product out of China, it's because people buy it. And uh, so, um, the responsibility is a bit like when we discuss about drugs. I mean, some people are producing drugs, but some people are buying drugs. And uh, it's up to the buyers to uh, make sure of where the risk comes from. And coming to your question, I will come to your question. Um, if you sell a wind turbine, you very often deal with government-related organization and you have very thick contracts. And one item of these contracts says that you, the wind turbine maker, investigate it as much as you can where the raw materials are coming from. And you know, funny enough, sometimes the guys realize that for the last five or ten years, they signed contract and they have absolutely no evidence in their whole company that they ever spend a minute to investigate where the material is coming from. And so it's true for the smuggled product, it's true for whatever you buy as a magnet, for instance, from China. It's very difficult to know where the material comes from, and that is essential. So, yeah, that's an advantage we have. Uh, we deal with a, a number, a few numbers of magnet makers inside and outside China to just provide to the end user a secure traceable supply chain. So you buy this magnet, this made from Linus, this is the batch number, you can check it through. And that has a very big value today. And I think there is a lot to be changed in the behavior of purchasers. Uh, it's the responsibility of everyone. I, I think where we're, we're leaning towards, of course, are the, the sensitive topics of geopolitics and uh, Let's talk about military, military sources and uh, throw this panel uh, another uh, loop here and let's talk to Anthony. Obviously, Anthony, when you're talking about your, uh, your contract with the Department of Defense, you uh, keep speaking in generalizations, you have to protect what you're saying, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that uh, if they want high purity rare earth oxides, this is obviously an interesting market sector. Can you tell me if the Chinese are producing this, or if they're selling it, or can you talk to this topic in general? Well, the, the issue of ultra-high purity, in other words, greater than four nines purity, uh, there is a market out there. Um, I can't comment on why the Department of Defense wanted what they wanted from us in that purity level, but needless to say, they, there are a lot of military applications for ultra-high purity ultra-high purity products, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, it's a it's very expensive, uh, difficult to produce product, and I think that's one of the areas where uh, the new technologies actually have an edge over China. To the best of my knowledge, uh, most solvent extraction systems can only get to a four nines. You then have to switch over to an ion exchange process, which is why it becomes so expensive. So I do think that you know, with new technologies, this is one area where I think we have uh, an edge over, uh, over China. Uh, but I also wanted to make a comment uh, er earlier. You know, it's interesting. Um, Apple produces, well, as many companies do, you know, produce uh, a required annual sustainability report. So they have two reports. One, conflict minerals, and which is a joke because they we don't know where they come from, so they try to estimate. But secondly, sustainability in terms of the raw materials that you're producing, how much pollution do they, uh, do they actually uh, generate? Interestingly, they do not mention rare earths at all 
in any of their, and, and that's because they don't really know. We've spoken to people at that company. If you think that the engineers at Apple have any idea how much rare earth they use, you're out of your mind. All they, it, it, it's an assembler. All they do is they go to their Chinese supplier and say, I need a specific component that fits in a specific, you know, part, in a specific area and it needs to do certain things. If you think that the Chinese come back and they say, okay, we can provide this, but hey, by the way, there's a certain amount of rare earth and here's what it is, you're out of your mind. The Apple has no clue, for the most part, where, uh, rather, to the extent to which rare earth products are used in, in their product. And then most companies are the same way. I once asked someone at Boeing who was producing, it was in the paper, they were producing um, a, some destructive lasers. Where are, you getting the la where are you getting the raw materials for your lasers? And they came back and said, oh, we're getting them from Germany. Like, you know, they don't produce, you know, there's no raw material from lasers that come from Germany. Ultimately, it's obviously China. But the point is most, most industrial companies, engineers, have no idea where raw materials uh, come from. And the fact of the matter is that all, they, all that the purchasing managers care about is I can get it at the lowest possible cost. All the, all the Japanese car manufacturers purchase illegal rare earths. You're kidding yourself if they don't. They, they have, their job is to produce the car as cheaply as possible. And if there's no label on the rare earth that says, oh, this came from you know, Linus versus you know, some, illegal, uh, some illegal mine. So that engineer or that purchasing manager's bonus is based on how low they can keep their raw materials cost. And if it comes from an illegal source, and there's no way to trace it, who's to know? So. Um, I just, you know, we're, we're talking about this, you know, certification, and, um, you know, obviously it requires buying from the end users, but I think in your quarterly uh, report, Paul, you guys talk about 50% or close to 50% of illegal um, mining from China was responsible, or was coming out of China was illegal, and that was responsible for pressing the prices. Um, what can we do? Is there anything we can do to get more certification, similar to you know blood diamonds, uh, what we saw there? Um, you know, even without Chinese buying, is there a way to, to approach that matter? Thank you. I think yeah. Alistair should take a run at this. Um, well, I think the real challenge is when you look at the supply chain for rares, that very few of them actually go into the final product. Um, you know, if you look at the magnet supply chain. You make neodymium oxide, that becomes neodymium metal, that then becomes neodymium alloy, that then becomes a magnet that is shipped to somebody who slices and dices it or whatever to make a component that is then assembled into an iPhone or a motor or something else. So it's a little more challenging in that regard. FCC Lansman is one of the few uses where you actually see it go into the final product. Um, you know, it does come, you know, Apple does do things like Anthony said about tantalum and, and so forth, but I think it's a, the problem is if it ever goes inside China, your traceability disappears. Like there's just absolutely no, I'll give you a personal example. To show, you know, you get ISO 9000 and then you have a, Tier, tier one supplier come in for a catalytic converter audit and uh, they go to their suppliers and they said, okay, we want traceability. And uh, production manager, factory basically said, oh, it's lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went for lunch. Right after lunch, there's a brand new book that showed the traceability of that lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, anything, let's say, anything's possible. And once you go inside China, uh, it's a black box. So getting that traceability, uh, it, you could mine tin in Malaysia and send it into China, you don't know where it came from. So the answer is flat out no. No, but uh, where's, the, where's the green piece when we need them? No, but uh, honestly, if you look in, uh, I'm from Quebec, province of Quebec, and we've seen uh, the disaster that uh, their campaign for uh, forest and uh, she completely shut down some, uh, some uh, forest companies in Quebec because of the campaign for uh, uh, Northern Forest, Borea Forest. So it can be that 
But honestly, I do believe that the end users have a serious problem themselves. I absolutely uh, am not uh, agree in agreement with uh, my colleague when he says that uh, the engineers don't know uh, nothing about uh, what's going on in China. They all know about it. They all shut their eyes. And uh, I think that Volkswagen is maybe the best example on top management saying that they need to deliver, they need to have cost control, and they need to get the raw material. We simply have companies that are too big, like the Tesla of this world or the Apples. They need to do their numbers, they need to get the raw material, they don't care what it comes from. And uh, we were talking about technology and uh, in this comment. And uh, I've seen on the lithium space, I know nothing about rare earth, but I know a lot about the lithium in China. And I can uh, tell you that in the past two years, we've seen tremendous increase in export from China to Korea and Japan, which nobody, nobody would have expected three years ago, because there was a demand for domestic market in China, very poor quality batteries, but it was good for their use domestic. And there was other specs for real batteries, Japan and Korea, and all material producers. Why did it increase? And how can they do that? Well, obviously, they were able, they were uh, over capacity in the, the supply, in the manufacturing. But the end users decided that they would lower their specs. So as of today, somebody that could not buy from Korea or Japan would not agree to buy no specs material on the lithium space because there is no new supply coming to the market from the big three are forced to lower their specs to be able to continue producing batteries. So they're, they're mixing material and low quality so they know about it. But there's nothing that was thought of doing in advance. Nobody seems in these companies to understand it, it takes 10, 15 years to develop a mining project to be uh, able to supply new material. So uh, they take the plan B and the plan C and the plan B and plan C is to lower the specs. The only way that you can get that traceability is to develop basically the mined magnet supply chain outside of China. Um, and I think that's the only way it'll ever be addressed. Uh, I think the end users are, a number of them now, are very sensitive to the situation. Um, so it's more one-to-one -one relationship uh, where an end user in particular will say, well, I want to make sure where the raw material comes from, where it's manufactured in metal, the volume, like that, etc. Uh, we can probably, we must do more. Uh, we must uh, probably work on uh, increasing the awareness of the consumers, simply because the consumers are the one making the final decision. That's the way we Now, coming to the point of an answer, um, so Linus, we supply rays as carbonate, oxide, metal, and alloy, traditionally, so the two last being Toys. And uh, recently, a number of the users came to us and said, well, why don't you supply to us magnets? Because at the end of the day, that would be the safest way for us to make sure that there is inside the customer lines. And, um, you know, we gave up, we, Western World, gave up Rears 30 years ago. Uh, we gave up manufacturing. Our manufacturing excellence for me is where China is leading all of us. The best Chinese companies are really uh, much ahead into manufacturing excellence, into business reactivity. So, taking this uh, example, an end user magnet asks us a quotation for magnets. Take my phone, I ring a few Chinese guys in the morning. In the afternoon, I have a very clear offer. We spend five minutes on the phone, we negotiate, done deal. I go for non-Chinese magnet makers, you guess where they are. It took one month. <laughs> and uh, the typical answer, the price is just way too high. I would spend two weeks to negotiate the bid down. And if I ask 400 times, they would say, well, we start with 100 because we're not sure. So that's not the question. <laughs> and, and so there is all this dynamism that is missing. Um, as Amanda said, we are in the US uh, or North America for two weeks here. And 
North America is definitely, although I don't know the market so well here, but I think a big user of magnets. How much magnets are manufactured in the US? None. I mean, peanuts. Uh, and that is the missing point. We, we need to have, it's not only resource, we need to close the gap. There is today 120,000 ton of magnet as a big block produced in China, 15,000 ton outside China. It used to be the same level, around the 12, 13,000 ton for China and outside China in 2005. But the rest out of China just remained flat and China increased 28% a year. And they are good. So it's a matter of putting together governments. I mean, this is a big uh, advantage of China. This is a driven country. The main real plans, industrial plans, strategic plans, say, well, we need, we want to go hybrid electrical cars. Where does it take? And we put everyone around the table. Well, here, we don't have one magnet maker in the room, as far as I know. Um, and, and the supply chain is not being put in place, so there is a lot to be developed. Yeah, but the China, we spoke and I've spoken to several magnet manufacturers in the U.S. who are not, who are not in the, uh, no longer in the business of, of these types of magnets. They're not willing to finance, they're not willing to put a dime into, you know, a uh, U.S. supply of the rare earth materials that are needed to make the magnets. They'll just tell you, talk to the government. So the problem in the United States is everybody points to everyone else and says, not my job to develop the market. Talk to the government. Talk to someone else. Don't talk to me. So, so I think. US looks like Europe. What's that? US looks like Europe. Right. Everybody wants everyone else to develop, you know, the market. And let me take this a step further. Uh, my backing, my background is an investment banker, and Alistair and I were involved in a deal a few years ago where uh, a large Chinese bank wanted to buy an American magnet maker. And I said, there's no way they're going to let you buy them. They're fifth generation Americans. And, uh, and their response was, well, we'll just buy them through this very large American bank. So yes, Chinese are ahead of us in strategy, Paul. I agree with you. So now I want to take us to a very controversial uh, topic. Since Jack's not here, we're going to hijack this and talk more about China, specifically about China's advantages. Um, one challenge we have in Investor Intel is publishing real numbers that, that are real. We have an Asian correspondent, which we joke is really a representative of the Chinese government, because we never get the same kind of copy twice, two weeks in a row. Jack's joke is always when Hong Po's gone for four weeks, he's being reprogrammed. So the issue is, we're told that the Chinese control 90% of the world supply of rare earths, they control 95% of the processing, this is a story we hear over and over and over again, yet our Russian correspondent tells us that Russia is producing and processing 10% of the world supply. Russia is very, very rarely uh, discussed with what facts they're actually uh, uh, involved in, but they keep putting out news items to us about their investments in technology, metals market. So where I want to take this panel next, because I can't wait to hear your responses, is about the real import versus export out of China. Um, we believe that the Chinese are actually going to need to actually import more technology metals here in the next little while, because their demand is so high and the rest of the world is really going to be at their beck and call because they're not going to export to us. I don't know if you agree with this, Guy, if you want to take this on first or talk about import and exports of technology metals out of China. Well, I'll just concentrate on the lithium. Um, there's no advantage to China for lithium because they're already importing most of the lithium that they are transforming. So on a world basis, uh, there, it's an advantage for all the lithium sector other producers because they're driving the price up because of their high cost of production because the, the highest cost of producing its own compounds is the lithium units. Their lithium units come mainly from uh, Australia and uh, therefore there's absolutely no advantage there. Uh, the ad, like I said earlier, started to increase significantly their export. Uh, at some point, they may control, the, if they wanted, they could control the lithium uh, cattle material it could control uh, the batteries. Uh, it, it might come to that at that point at some uh, some maybe a decade from now. 
uh, Japan was uh, representing, well, was the largest, maybe 10 years ago, the largest cattle material producer. Now they have uh, lost their market share, or well, they keep kept the same production level. But increase in new cattle manufacturers outside of Japan made them not insignificant, but they went from 95% of the production to below 20%. A uh, lot of increase in the capacity in China, a lot of capacity of the Chang compounds exported to these two countries mainly, but in at one point, when they decide, they will just, like for the rivers, stop exporting or slowing down and do the cattle material themselves. They presently do cattle material, but for the domestic market, like I said, bad quality. But they're increasing their capacity, increasing their capacity at some point, they will be able to jump to the other uh, high quality some uh, cattle material uh, and uh, they could, they could uh, take the control. Should we expect any off-take agreements with the Chinese here, Guy, anytime soon? For me, uh, no, absolutely not. We have, uh, we have uh, from the start, said that we were not going to be uh, shipping sputtering concentrate as a raw material to China, uh, like Allison is currently doing decided to transform into high value added lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate in Quebec, specifically to have a geographical and geopolitical diversification of the main sources. Currently, uh, most of the, uh, well, most 52%, 55% of the world supply comes from Chile and Argentina. The rest comes from China, converting from one single source, Australia. So if tomorrow, something happens somewhere, you're linked to three locations. So we do believe, and that's why I'm very glad that the Chinese decided to buy Talisman, because it's driving the cost of the some compounds up, and that will justify diversification and newcomers into the, into the play. And uh, Quebec and Canada is the best place to, uh, to have a new supplier. So Paul, your, your sales are obviously affected by this. Can you comment? Um, just a year and a half ago, uh, we were going through some troubles, and uh, one of the lenders uh, was uh, really checking to detail what was going on in Linus, including on the business side, and they said, well, we'd like to interview some of the customers. I would like to interview, uh, including a Chinese customer of Linus. So I said, no problem, so I rang one of them, and asked him if he would agree on uh, being interviewed by uh, a banker, basically. He said, well, I'm fine as long as you provide me some training because I never did that before. So I said, okay, fine. let's have one hour on the phone together. And here we go. So, Louis, uh, what's your name? What are you doing? What's your company doing? What's the product, etc." And then we come to the major question. So, why are you buying from Linus? And Louis answered, uh, because you provide me with long-term contract. That's an interruption of an interview. Let's come to We know each other for 15 years. I saw product view as a uh, road before, as well as today, and never, never sign a long term deal with you, and you never ask me for a long term deal. And uh, so, what's the point? If we know each other very well. If you want a long term contract, why do you never bring this on the table? I said, no, we have a long term contract because when we sign a deal with you for one, two containers, or whatever, while well, you stick to your commitment, sometimes you are late in the deliveries, it was a year and a half ago. But you will never change the conditions, and that's what he calls long term. And uh, so again, there is opportunities for us <laughs> in that uh, market. Anthony, do you want to comment? Uh, not really. One of the things I do want to comment on, which it's, uh, it relates to this topic, is I don't think people realize the extent to which world events could potentially, in an instant impact what, what we're doing here since we're talking about China. I don't know if people follow what's going on in the South China Sea uh, with the United States uh, now beginning to send uh, patrol ships to some of the islands that China has been you know, building. But you have a real potential for you know, some fairly significant world events to have a replay of 2011. You know, and I think most people I believe falsely assume that because the Chinese are doing so much business with the Western world that they would never 
uh, do anything militarily against one of those countries. And th that's, in my opinion, you go back in history, uh, World War I especially, you'll see that that's not the case. China is run by the military. It's not run by business people. And so all I can say is watch what's going on in the uh, China seas, because I do think that has a real potential to affect world markets for all commodities, not just the rare earth. This time last year, each of the different countries outside of China has taken a different approach to securing the supply chain. This time last year, we had a you know, number of customers that had our plant in Malaysia. And um, Jari, our senior secured lender, is actually the Japanese government, right? And, um, and that is because their job is to assure the supply of essential raw materials. They put 225 real you know, million, uh, $225 million on the table to do this, right? And uh, we also had the Resource Alliance from Germany who have mapped the supply chain and done the research and have some chats on a regular basis. They have not actually put any money on the table. And to your point earlier, you know, here in, in, in the US, it's like, well, go and talk to somebody else. So, um, both the representative from JARA and the representative from um, Resource Alliance got up and said all of the conditions that led to the situation in 2010-2011 still exist. Right? It was funny because it was about a week after there was one of those summits when you had uh, Abe and um, Lee sort of shaking hands but refusing to look at each other at, 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 at the conference. So, so if the things that you're talking about do happen, Anthony. The Japanese actually are in good shape, right? Because they actually put their money on the table. And guess what? We will supply them. Alistair, can you comment on that? I think sure. I'd love your comment, especially about the Japanese too, with the um, dining well, cell island well, conflict. To Paul's point, um, people ask me, uh, how can you trust the Chinese? And I think the, the best way of describing that is to Paul's point about long-term contract. In North America, Europe, when you get together, you usually have a lawyer attached to your hip, and so people trust you. Like when you meet somebody for the first time, you trust them until they prove to you that they're a crook. In Asia, uh, Japan, South Korea, China, they assume you're a crook until you can prove to them that you're not. That's a longer process. And that's why things take time in Asia. And that's why you spend a lot of time developing relationships. But on the other hand, once you have that relationship, it lasts for a long time. I negotiated a JV for a French company in uh, Inner Mongolia. The document was you know, huge. And I basically told them, sign, I'll sign the documents for you, put it in a drawer, lock it. The minute you have to open that drawer to read the contract, you're in trouble. So it's all about, in Asia, relationships. They see lawyers as note takers because they recognize that you can't put every eventuality in black and white. And so at the end of the day, if there's a problem, the two of you sit down and you work it out. And I think to me that's why, you know, after being there for 20 years, there's a few people that you can shake hands with and it's actually better that way than signing a piece of paper.